House of Cards is brought to you by Drizzly, your online liquor store. Available in over 95 cities across North America, Drizzly offers a huge selection and competitive pricing with a side of personalized content. Now there's no need to leave the house. Get alcohol delivered in less than an hour by Drizzly. Head on over to drizzly.com and order today. And now get $5 off your first order of $20 or more when using promo code DRINK19 at checkout. Shop beer, wine, and liquor with drizzly.com. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, you're listening to House of Cards. Today, the game is different. I want to gamble. Gambling is a very serious business. Is that clear? Welcome to House of Cards. Dave Weishadow with you here deep from the swamps of Jersey. we got a great show coming up for you. It's been a busy couple of weeks in the gambling world. One of the biggest gambling entities has been created. There's a live streaming poker scandal coming out of California. And what better way to keep us up to date on what's going on in the gambling world is to talk with Adam Small from usbets.com. And right after this break, that's exactly what we're going to do. So stick around. We'll be right back with House of Cards. House of Cards is brought to you by Drizzly, your online liquor store. Available in over 95 cities across North America, Drizzly offers a huge selection and competitive pricing with a side of personalized content. Now there's no need to leave the house. Get alcohol delivered in less than an hour by Drizzly. Head on over to drizzly.com and order today. And now get $5 off your first order of $20 or more when using promo code DRINK19 at checkout. Shop beer, wine, and liquor with drizzly.com. Yeah, you, come here. Haven't you heard? We don't need to hide anymore. Now, we can shop privately for adult products at adamandeve.com. They've got massage oils, lingerie, and lots more we can't mention here. Use offer code SPICE404. They'll give you 50% off almost any one item, three free DVDs, free mystery gift, and free shipping. That's 50% off, free shipping, and more. Private shopping starts at adamandeve.com. You're listening to House of Cards. I'll bet you 20 bucks I can get you gambling before the end of the day. No way. I'll give you three to one odds. No. Nope. Five to one. No. Nope. Ten to one. You're on.
Welcome back to House of Cards. Dave Weishaddle with you. Big things are happening in the gambling world. Over the last couple of weeks, gaming companies have pulled the trigger on some of the biggest and most important deals that we've ever seen in the industry. Also, there was a very interesting poker game that was live streamed out of California that's causing an uproar in the gambling community. And as always, to keep us updated on what's going on in the gambling world, we have Adam Small from usbets.com. Adam, thanks for joining us. Dave, it's awesome to be back on the show after a while. I know, it's been a while. Boy, it's, uh, you know, and I always have a lot of stuff to tell you. You always come on on, on the best weeks. You know, you got major that's, deals happening. That's what I try to do. There you go. You, you time it perfectly. You got major deals. We got uh, streaming controversies. Uh, it's perfect time for you to be on. I think what happens. I think what happens is uh, I, I come on the show and I end up sounding smarter because I have more to talk about. So I got to come on when things are really eventful, and, and that makes me look good. Yeah, yeah. Well, you're you're here for the ratings. That's what it is. You you come on with the big deals. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I want to start with one of the big deals. I mean, uh, Flutter Entertainment has acquired the Stars Group, and I know this has ramifications throughout the gambling world. But I want to start off with the main players. I, I know a lot of people who listen to the show know a lot about the Stars Group. But a lot of people are not familiar with Flutter Entertainment. I mean, for those who don't know, can you tell us a little bit about Flutter Entertainment? Sure. Yeah, it's, it's a recently rebranded company name. It used to be called Patty Power Bet Fair. And it's the result of a mega merger from a few years ago between uh, Patty Power and Betfair, which are both huge European uh, gambling companies that handle quite a bit of uh, both brick and mortar and uh, online handle around the world. And uh, while you may not have, have heard if you're in the U.S. Of, of Betfair or especially Patty Power, just because they're mostly European-facing brands, uh, you've definitely heard of some of the stuff they own, such as FanDuel, for example. Uh, they also own the fantasy sports site Draft. They own the Horse Racing Network, TBG, and, uh, and they have a number of other assets around the world. So they're massive. And, uh, and then Stars Group, of course, is not just Poker Stars. It's also now Fox Bet in the United States. It's Crown Bet in Australia. It's Sky Bet, which they acquired not terribly long ago, which is massive in Europe, and, uh, and a number of other brands. So both of these companies have already undertaken mergers and acquisitions that have kind of tried to make each of them the biggest gambling company in the world, and now they're merging together. And it just seems like this just keeps happening over and over and over again in our industry. Company A merges with company B and is now the largest gambling company in the world, uh, which is now, you know, company C. And then later on, company C merges with company D and, you know, lather, rinse, repeat. So uh, we're just seeing more and more consolidation on the operator side. I mean, do we now know how this entity is going to look like? I mean, is it going to be run by Flutter? Is it going to be run by the Stars Group? I mean, I know there are stockholders involved. There are board members. I mean, do we know what this entity is going to look like? I do not have details like, uh, you know, which executives are going to survive the merger and things like that. I've heard it referred to as both a merger and as Flutter acquiring the Stars Group. So I'm not even entirely sure how it's structured, uh, but uh, what what it does sound uh, what what does sound likely in terms of you know how this is going to affect the U.S. is that I don't think any brands are going away, any particular brands anytime soon. The main brands in the U.S. that are affected by this are Betfair, which uh, runs casino in New Jersey, an online casino in New Jersey, uh, FanDuel, which is of course a huge DFS site, and Sportsbook now in Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and uh, and New Jersey, and more states coming, and uh, Draft, the fantasy site Draft, uh, TVG, so all of these things, uh, Foxbet, Poker Stars. I, I don't see any of them consolidating within the U.S. We're going to have just all these different brands running under the same umbrella. See, that was one of my questions when I when I saw what was happening here. I mean, I'm wondering how these entities are going to work together, if one's going to be consumed by another entity. I mean, I guess we're going to have to wait down the road to see how they work in tandem with each other, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's it's just uh, there's, there's a long way to go before we see how this all uh, how this all plays out. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely, 
it's looking to me more like a situation where they try to run multiple brands and suck up as much of the market as possible. And I think it remains to be seen how those brands will differ from each other and complement each other. Because I, I know that, for example, Fox Bet, the point is to go after the TV audience, uh, you know, the people that are watching sports on Fox and, um, you know, talking through sports commentators about betting and, and things like that. Whereas FanDuel's uh, marketing strategy has been much more geared around their DFS marketing strategy and then trying to convert players over from the DFS side to sports betting. So those are two very different approaches to bringing in players and, and should attack different market segments. In terms of product differentiation, it's still it's kind of hard to say exactly what what those audience would want that's different from one another. What does the Fox Bet audience want that's different from the FanDuel audience? And uh, I think those are the kind of details that we're going to see shake out over the next few years. Hold that thought, and we'll be right back with more House of Cards right after this quick break. You're listening to House of Cards. Where was the house? Where was the house of cards? Welcome back to House of Cards. Dave Weishaddle with you here. For those of you just joining us, I am talking with Adam Small from usbets.com. You know, you, you mentioned it, and when you look at these entities being created, you know, I see Fox, I, I see TVG, and they're both very prominent media companies. I mean, how important is it for this deal that media companies are involved? And do you see more deals like this where the media companies are involved in the uh, new entities that are going to be created? Yeah, absolutely. I think I think it is the future. It's already the present in other parts of the world, and it's definitely going to be where things are headed. And the reason for this is pretty simple, which is that um, certainly in the U.S. to date, the biggest issue that uh, gaming providers, and especially online gaming providers, have had um, in terms of managing growth is that acquisition costs for players are just sky high, whether it's TV advertising, affiliates, anything else that they do, they're paying huge uh, cost per acquisition of each individual player that they're bringing in. And that is making it very difficult to achieve a positive bottom line. If you look at the online casinos in New Jersey, for example, uh, which have done really well and by all accounts are a huge success uh, just as a whole, um, most of them never made a profit to date or, you know, have barely squeaked out a profit because the, the marketing and acquisition costs are just so massive for them. So I think that getting, getting into a situation where media companies either own you or have an equity stake or you're partnered somehow um, in a way that allows um, the media companies to get an ongoing share of proceeds rather than having to pay those media companies flat rates or, or uh, affiliate revenue for advertising is a way to ensure, one, to keep those costs down somewhat, but I think even more importantly from the operator perspective, they want to make sure that they can actually get those players. Because that, that's the biggest and hardest thing, is there are only so many faucets you can turn on to get all those players. And I mean, we've seen it play out on the affiliate side, my side of this business, where there are only really a couple 
handful of affiliates sending substantial traffic in uh, in the U.S. for for regulated markets. Uh, we're one of them. Catena Media is one of them, and beyond that, there's not really very much that's sending a lot. And so, uh, you know, if you're not in a, in a prominent positions with those companies, you're not getting a whole lot. And I think with media, it's similar. There are only a handful of major media companies that can send you a lot of traffic regularly. And if you're not partnering with them or getting bought by them or merging with them or, or whatever, then one of your competitors probably is. And at some point, it's just going to be like there's just no way in for other operators, and they're just going to be stuck without any any acquisition funnels at all. So overall, what does this mean for the gambling industry as a whole? I mean, do deals like this really benefit the consumer, and should we expect more and more deals like this in the near future? I don't think it benefits the consumer, no. I mean, I'm sure you'll hear attempts to spin it that way. I think that um, any consolidation is typically at least long-term bad for consumers because uh, they're going to have more more incentive to engage in anti-competitive tactics and less incentive to uh, do things like competitive promotions and pricing. Uh, so I, I think that you know, you're going to see, and we're not nearly at this point yet, by the way, in the U.S., we're not nearly at this point where there are one or two dominant providers and they have total control over everything and, and uh, customers don't have any options. We're, we're a long, long way from that still, but it is a step in that direction. It's a step in the direction where if, um, you know, Foxbet and FanDuel, for example, become the two predominant brands in the U.S., which I think is a very reasonable outcome at this point to believe could and will happen, at least in a number of states, mm -hmm. then, um, you know, at, at what point do they stop focusing on giving value to customers and just start focusing on anti-competitive behavior, uh, you know, blocking out competitors or just making it pretty much impossible for, for customers to go anywhere else. And so uh, that, that's the point that I think from a consumer perspective, we don't want to get to. And we've seen that from um, other industries. I mean, I think, you know, airlines are a good example mm -hmm. where, um, remember, I mean, 15 years ago or whatever it was, and we still had before Northwest merged with Delta, before United bought Continental and um, so on and so forth. And it seemed like there were a lot more good prices to choose from on flights places. And now all of a sudden flights have gotten really expensive and, you know, you're sitting in a seat that's big enough for like one arm of your body and, and basically sitting on top of other people. And, and yet all the flights are full. Every seat is full every time. So, you know, the more efficient the operators get, uh, getting back to sports betting and the more sure of themselves that they can, you know, max out the customer base, the less, uh, the less value they're going to offer consumers. And, and that's, I think that's the risk of these deals. You know, I, I've talked to lots of heads of gaming commissions across the country, and without fail, they all mentioned that they were keenly aware of what the states next to them were doing when formulating their plans for gambling expansion. Do you think deals like this in the private sector will spur states on when considering to allow sports betting or online sports betting or online casinos? Well, I think, I mean, I think that from that perspective, it's probably a positive just in terms of pushing for regulation. Um, I haven't really fully thought this through, but I, I think that, um, you know, when you have individual companies with this much market power, they've got more political power too. And when their goals uh, politically are similar to ours in terms of just getting states to pass laws, then, I mean, that's probably a positive for, for pushing states to move faster. Of course, that being said, these, these very, you know, growing, growingly powerful organizations may push for legislation that is less beneficial to consumers, less beneficial to other people living in this ecosystem, uh, companies like ours, that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the states regulate in ways that is less friendly to the rest of us and more friendly just to just to flutter TSG, whatever the company is going to be called going forward. So, um, I mean, that, that's a risk. I mean, there, there are specific ways that they could do that. I mean, a big part of it is that they could push for legislation that, that makes it tougher for competitors to enter the market. And we already saw that in the DFS space when a few years ago, uh, after all the scandals with DFS around 2015, 
did help. The lobbying effort was very successful in getting a lot of states to legalize DFS very quickly. But uh, in a number of states, you've seen complaints, I'm sure, on Twitter of just legislation that seems purposely set up to make it so that FanDuel and DraftKings will be the only competitors in the market, whether it's via high licensing fees or a regulatory cost that can only be borne by companies with at least a certain size. And, uh, and you know, they can frame that as being good for consumers. They can say that, um, you know, it's good that these companies are well capitalized and are big. And, and the argument has merit, but it, it, in a space that's still very much in, um, you know, the early phases, I'm not sure that it's really a positive to make it so exclusive at this early point. Hold that thought, and we'll be right back with more House of Cards right after this quick break. Hey, this is Dave Weishaud from House of Cards with your House of Cards gaming report for the week of October 21st, 2019. A lawsuit has been filed stemming from the Mike Postel Stones Gambling Hall poker scandal. 25 plaintiffs have filed a $30 million federal lawsuit alleging that Mike Postel cheated during a live stream poker game at the Stones Gambling Hall near Sacramento. The alleged cheating was spotted by viewers who were watching a live stream of the cash game. The Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board has reported that the Commonwealth's casinos brought in over $3.2 billion during the fiscal year of 2018 to 2019. That's an increase of 1.1% from last year with online casinos and sports betting given as the reason for the jump. The top-earning casino in Pennsylvania was Parks Casino bringing in over $614 million for the year. And finally, a second casino company has been named as a founding sponsor for Allegiant Stadium being built in Las Vegas. The San Manuel Band of Mission Indians, who run the San Manuel Casino in California, joined Caesars Entertainment as sponsors for the Raiders' new home in Vegas. A spokesman for the Raiders expects that this will not be the last casino sponsorship for the new stadium. Have any news or tips regarding casinos, gaming, or legislation? Send us an email at newsroom at houseofcardsradio.com and follow us on Twitter at HOC Radio. Abandoned prison in Philadelphia becomes the number one haunted attraction in America. Terror behind the walls at Eastern State Penitentiary presented by Luke Oil. Are you brave enough to opt in for a more intense experience? You could be grabbed, sent into hidden passageways, and even separated from your group. This is terror like you've never felt. Save $10 with coupons from any Luke Oil location. TerrorBehindTheWalls.com you're listening to House of Cards. Check out our website at houseofcardsradio.com. Welcome back to House of Cards. Dave Weishaddle with you. For those of you just joining us, I am talking with Adam Small from usbets.com. You know, I want to switch gears for a bit and uh, get your opinion on a news story that's gripping the poker world. And since you're one of the creators of PocketFives.com, uh, you're the perfect person to ask. And, of course, I'm talking about the – I'm going to say the alleged cheating that went on at the Stones Gambling Hall outside of Sacramento, where, again, it's been alleged that it was discovered during a live streaming poker game that Mike Postel displayed some questionable conduct. I just want to get your take on what you've seen and what you've heard about the incident. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, 
I, I was going to say, you know, I haven't heard anything about this, right? But I, I don't think anyone <laughs> believes that. <laughs> it's, it's all consuming. And, oh, my uh, God. Twitter, and I mean, it, it made it all the way to ESPN, Sports Center. It's kind of unbelievable because when you think of all the um, sort of the historical scandals and, you know, cheating allegations and other things that have happened in poker, this isn't really, from my perspective, even like. I don't know, it's certainly not in the top five that I've seen over the last 15 years in terms of just the uh, the impact of it. Mm-hmm. But we're talking a six-figure impact, which is certainly more than nothing, but it's not, you know, it's not a massive amount of money. Um, is, is, is said, it, I'm not trying to downplay it is at it, all. Is it I a, mean, the allegations... Well, well, <laughs> yeah, well let me tell you, uh, is it a big story, not because of the, you know, amount in, amount of money involved, but just the alleged brazenness of the conduct? I think that's what's so fascinating about it. I think that's what is so captivating because clearly people are captivated. I mean, Joey Ingram is live streaming videos at like one o'clock in the morning and, uh, and has 10,000 people tuned in. <laughs> I, 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 let, let me tell you something. Joey Ingram <laughs> is giving a, a, a classroom on poker. It's just absolutely amazing. And uh, it, it's just fantastic. Yeah, he's actually he's on the uh, the U.S. Bets podcast, Gamble On, as Great. well to talk about this. Um, on uh, I guess uh, today they were recording uh, October 10th, so people want to check that out. They can hear Joey talk to John Brennan and Eric Raskin about it. But yeah, just getting back to uh, the scandal. So I mean, it's really interesting. Uh, Mike Postel, uh, the person in question, who I mean, I think at this point there are very few people that actually that actually doubt that he's cheated in some way. Um, But he's a guy that I've known for more than 15 years. Uh, We met all the way back in 2004. He used to live in Tunica, and I was living in Nashville. It's not too far away. And so um, we used to catch up at at poker tournaments and down there sometimes, and and, uh, definitely someone I thought of uh, as a friend for many years. We've We've had some sporadic contact over the years, although I haven't seen him in a long time. Um, and he was kind of one of these these original uh, pros on on ultimatebet.com and on some other online poker sites that back before uh, that was really developed, uh, before online poker was really developed like it is today, when things were kind of just sprouting up. He was one of the early winners, someone who already had some experience playing poker and was a successful player, was definitely a winning player. Um, played a lot online in those days and also a lot live. And so, um, he was, he was a known player and has been a known player in poker for a long time. And I don't think, um, I, I don't know that he really was associated with, with any really bad behavior before this. I mean, I don't, I don't think that he was, you know, I don't think that he had like a, anything other than maybe just kind of a neutral reputation in the community. He was friends with a lot of players, but I would say his reputation was just kind of neutral. He was just one of the guys that was there that was playing. And uh, and then this thing comes out, and I mean, it's just it's it's clearer and clearer as more evidence comes out that he uh, that he was up to no good out there in Sacramento. Um, that he you know figured out some way to get real-time information about opponents' cards, and that he just, he wasn't even, he wasn't even really trying that hard to conceal it, just wasn't even really thinking through, um, wasn't really thinking through what it would be like if if anyone caught wind of it, because, you know, he, he just, like, was all the, like, laughing after winning hands, and, uh, you know, just how, how brazen his win rate was with yeah. all this that he was doing, and um, and doing it time and time again and, and the, uh, you know, looking at his phone and his lap and all that, it just, it seems like he's a person who thought there was no way he would ever get caught. And that's interesting to me just because I think that, you know, if I were trying to be a criminal and, and, you know, engage in behavior that would lead to kind of effectively stealing money from people that I'd probably be really nervous about it going in and trying to do it in a way that wouldn't uh, wouldn't attract attention to me but it just seems like you know he wasn't really that clever about it and uh, it's interesting because I mean you know it's just it's really it's really bizarre to see I mean he did get away with it for a long time and yeah, nobody exactly. noticed it just because we're all so predisposed to believing that the game is fair when we're playing in a mm-hmm. casino. Like we're we're just very predisposed to believe that if we're getting beat by someone, it's because they're better than us, and not because something else is going on. And it takes, uh, like you know, it, it's difficult with that inertia to get to the point where someone is just like, "Wait, something's wrong here," right? 
Yeah, it, it, it seems like the viewers of the live stream that raised some of the concerns regarding the poker game. I mean, from your understanding, what were they seeing that threw up the red flags in their minds? Well, so it was um, uh, Veronica. Some, I think Veronica Brill is her name, yeah. uh, the uh, broadcaster who kind of originally noticed it. And it's just, it's very clear she'd been watching him for months and it hadn't hit her and it all kind of hit her in one moment. Like they all, they all seemed to have this belief on the air that he was just so good that he was picking people off all the time. And he is a good poker player. Like he's someone that's had a reputation as a, as a strong player for years and years. But um, I think that, you know, they're just watching and they're like, wow, how does he does it? How does he do it? He's so solid. Like same way you watch Bill Ivey or, or one of these guys when they play and they just keep making the right moves, clever moves over and over again. And at some point it was like the light bulb turning on when you watch a cartoon, um, you know, just like the proverbial, like the light bulb flicks on. She's watching and she sees that one hand, that one hand. Um, I can't even remember what the cards were in that specific hand, but it's the one where she kind of had that discovery and her co-host is droning on about, oh, Apostle is just God and he's just incredible and how does he do it over and over and over again. And she's, she's, you can see she's just uncomfortable all of a sudden. Like it all hit her like a ton of bricks at once. Like, holy crap, he's not that good. He's just cheating. Like... She, and, and it was it was like she had a moment of clarity on it. That, that's that's yeah. what I saw there. Like you can see it kind of in her face and in her tone of voice where all of a sudden it's not fascination with how well this guy's playing anymore. It's an instinct that something is off, that something's wrong, that he shouldn't be able to do this time and time again uh, where every single time he's right. And uh, it's interesting because, I mean, with online – I mean, the way that they caught those guys on, on UB and Absolute Poker years ago, the super users, was that they had stats. People were tracking the games on Poker Tracker and and could see the win rates and could see how how wrong these win rates were. I mean, before they got, you know, the leaked hand history and the leaked, uh, you know, information that, that made it easier to analyze, they just they had this information from people's tracking that there were accounts that were winning at rates that, didn't make any sense and with live poker you just don't really have that like unless someone is watching this stream and and documenting it every single day you just don't have uh that kind of information and it does mean that this kind of thing might be easier to get away with for a while until it's not right yeah yeah i I know just recently uh, a lawsuit was filed as well i guess it was it's 10 million dollars that the um, plaintiffs are looking for i guess i guess they they cited the owner of the gambling hall, the director who was running the game. I mean, it, it, you've been around poker rooms a lot. I mean, what is the responsibility of the poker room in this situation? Well, I think the responsibility of the poker room is huge. Um, the reason that the people there believe the game is fair is because of the casino mm-hmm. or because of the poker room. Um, you don't go to a game at someone's house uh, that you don't know and assume that it's 100% fair. Or if you do, you're kind of naive because, you know, I've played at some underground games. I played some around here in Atlanta where I live, and I played at them in Nashville and elsewhere, um, games that, you know, are not regulated but are just kind of uh, house games being run with a rake. And, and I've been to ones that seem very legit, that have security, that have, you know, a bunch of regulars that – are watching and still I've never felt 100% comfortable in those games because I never know exactly what everyone's up to and maybe if I'm like the only guy in the room that doesn't know what's going on uh, but in a casino you never expect that you don't think about it at all I don't think that I don't remember any time where I've ever been sitting in a game and the win or the Bellagio or you know whatever place and you know even Tunica or, or whatever where I felt like I wasn't 100% sure that the game was fair. It just never even occurred to me that I might, you know, not not have the same opportunity to win as everyone else at the table. And, I mean, that's, that's the legitimacy that the regulated poker room in California lends to that game. Their job is to make sure that the game is as everyone believes it to be and not something else. And so I, I do believe, I believe that, um, you know, if there is a financial penalty to pay for this, whether it be a lawsuit or be a fine or whatever else, that the casino is going to be a major responsible party, if not the responsible party in this. Uh, players cheat and you know, there'll be consequences for that, or there certainly should be. Mm-hmm. But the casino is the one that's really in charge of making sure that doesn't happen. And they, they just, they drop the ball big time here. 
You know, I know a lot of people in poker and even esports, and they do a lot of live streaming through Twitch. Now, I, I don't know too much about Twitch, but do you think in this situation it highlights some of the problems or potential pitfalls entities may have when live streaming either poker or esports for their events? Definitely. I mean, I think it's it's making a lot of people take a step back and second guess, you know, just how good these kinds of things are for the game. I'm, I'm very much the belief that they are good for the game. I think Twitch and just live streaming generally has, has been huge for poker. I mean, you're seeing the World Series of Poker main event growing now again uh, pretty nicely year over year, and you're watching it really for the last couple of years for the first time you're watching it in, in live action on on tv stick around we'll be right back with house of cards House of Cards is brought to you by Drizzly, your online liquor store. Available in over 95 cities across North America, Drizzly offers a huge selection and competitive pricing with a side of personalized content. Now there's no need to leave the house. Get alcohol delivered in less than an hour by Drizzly. Head on over to drizzly.com and order today. And now get $5 off your first order of $20 or more when using promo code DRINK19 at checkout. Shop beer, wine, and liquor with drizzly.com. Yeah, you, come here. Haven't you heard? We don't need to hide anymore. Now, we can shop privately for adult products at adamandeve.com. They've got massage oils, lingerie, and lots more we can't mention here. Use offer code SPICE404. They'll give you 50% off almost any one item, three free DVDs, free mystery gift, and free shipping. That's 50% off, free shipping, and more. Private shopping starts at adamandeve.com. You're listening to the House of Cards. Whoa! I think we got a show. Oh, yeah, we got a show. We definitely got a show. Oh, yeah, there's a show. Hey, it's all about ratings, baby, and we got them. Welcome back to House of Cards. Dave Weishaddle with you here. For those of you just joining us, I am talking with Adam Small from usbets.com. Sorry about that. Radio has to do its business, you know. Why don't you continue what you were saying before the break? I think people just enjoy this form of poker more, just watching it, how it's really happening. That's just an evolution in the way people like to watch poker. And I don't think that's going to change because of a scandal. Um, I do think that people take a step back and wonder and worry about it and maybe are less comfortable with RFID tables or with live streaming or whatever else. And I think that it's going to be on the on the operators, on the casinos and whoever else is running these games and whoever's in charge of these live streams and just all of the different kind of access points to these games that they're going to have to, um, they're going to have to assure people, they're going to have to find a way to make people feel comfortable that this is secure, that the game that they're playing, I mean, at Stone's Gambling, we're talking about a pretty small stakes game, really in the scheme of things. You know, if you're playing a tournament with millions of dollars on the line or a high stakes cash game or whatever else, players are going to need to know that it's fair. You know, I know the poker room just hired a former U.S. prosecutor to investigate the matter. So I, I guess the story is far from being over. Is this one of those news stories that's going to last a long time? And what do you think the ramifications in the, in the poker community that this incident will bring about? Yeah, I think it's going to last a long time. I don't think that people are going to forget about Mike Postel and this situation next week. I think that probably there's going to be more investigation of where else these uh, where else these games are happening and if similar is going on elsewhere. I think there's going to be more more and more skepticism about uh, about these games, especially in smaller venues and just uh, what the oversight is like and and things like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think that this story is going to have legs. It's going to, I, I'm guessing, be resolved legally one way or the other. I mean, and, and, and on that note, by the way, I mean, before I kind of completely move off this, I think it's important to say that for people expecting a resolution that, you know, in effect punishes someone, whether it's the casinos, uh, the people involved in cheating, Apostle, whoever he's working with, etc., I think that people need to understand that um, despite the fact that I think we're all pretty sure that this happened, um, it hasn't been proven, certainly not. I mean, you're, you're a lawyer, right, Dave? 
you yeah. know, I mean, uh, it, it just hasn't been proven. Uh, there's no, like, you need, you can't just say no. uh, his win rate was higher than other people's. I don't think that would work in a court of law. So um, you, you can't say this is how I think he did it. Uh, you're going to have to figure out actually what happened and be able to prove that and be able to prove that there was, you know, impropriety. So I think there's still a ways to go just in terms of investigating. I think the investigation is still uh, is still kind of pending until they figure out how exactly he did it, where he got the information, how he was getting it, and who else was involved, and and you know some kind of some kind of way to to really prove what happened. And until then, you know, we'll still have opportunistic people like Mike Mattisau who want to come out and say ridiculous things like, you know, you're going to get unfair treatment and all this and nothing's been proven and, you know, spinning it the way they want to really probably for their own reasons. I think it's pretty clear Madison just wanted attention and, and, you know, that's fine, whatever. But I think that the door is going to stay open for that kind of stuff until someone is able to concretely prove what happened. And of course, you know, bringing that back to your question, I think that that will help with how this is dealt with uh, elsewhere because, uh, once you know how he cheated, it's going to be easier to prevent that happening in the future. Let me tell you something. If I was a lawyer in this case, I would call Joey Ingram as an expert witness because he, I, he basically lays <laughs> it all out in Twitter. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I honestly, um, I think Joey Ingram is incredible. Um, Absolutely. I think he's a terrific guy. I've met him uh, in person a couple of times and I've been on his podcast and we've talked a lot over the last few years. I think he's awesome. I think there's a reason that so many people follow him and like him and it's because he's tireless in pursuit of uh, this kind of story. Like he's someone that everybody feels they can trust, that everyone feels like will give a fair shake to the story and will, um, you know, portray it honestly. But also, I mean, I, I believe that Joey, if he wanted to, could be an incredible investigative reporter for a more traditional journalistic outlet. If that, if he were so inclined, I just think he's got that ability, that natural ability to figure out what is what is noise and what is actual uh, substantive information, and to get to the bottom of these stories in ways that I think most of us find incredibly difficult to uh, to take all this different information and compile it in a way that actually gives us clarity on a situation. So I'm I'm really thankful that he's out there working on these kind of things. The work Doug Polk done, has done is, is good, too. Uh, but Joey, in particular, to me, just uh, is really like he's taken it upon himself that it's his responsibility to figure out what people need to know about this story, what's important here, and get that information out to the public. And he's doing it in a way that no one else really seems capable of. So, um, you know, kudos to him. He's really done incredible work here. And he's done incredible work for years on a number of things for the community. But this is a big one. And he's going to be on the Gamble On podcast, too. So, Yes, sir, yeah. he is. Yeah, yeah. By the time anyone hears this show, it'll already be on there. So okay, great. check it out at usbets.com. <laughs> Adam, we're running out of time, but I want to remind everyone that they can keep up to date with these developing gambling and sports betting news stories at usbets.com. They have some of the best writers in the country covering the casino and sports betting world. Adam Small, as always, thanks for coming on and keeping us up to date on what's going on in the casinos and the sports books. Yeah, it's great to be here. It's awesome to be back. This is really fun. Thanks. Well, that'll do it for us this week. I'll see you next time on House of Cards.